If you've ever played a game like Fire Emblem, Pokemon, or pretty much anything turn-based, there's a great chance that you've experienced the power of the command pattern. But that's not to say that the command pattern is limited to just turn-based games. So today we'll dive into the command pattern, learn what it is and how it can help make our game's logic preservable, interchangeable, and even undoable. Welcome to Programming for Production, a series here in iHeart Game Dev where we break down relatively complex software development topics so that we know how and when to use them while developing our games. A quick but huge shout out to all of the current patrons for selecting this video's topic. And now, let's get started. Controller remapping, undo and redo systems, turn-based battle systems, replay systems are just some of the amazing features we can build using the command pattern. Today, let's learn the fundamentals. In modern programming, we define classes. And classes have these internal functions called methods. Methods perform specific logic that we also define. To use these methods, we call or invoke them in other parts of our class or other parts of our code base. Sometimes methods require data called parameters that are used in the method's logic. And sometimes they don't. And none of this is likely news to you if you're researching the command pattern. But today we want to take a look at a very specific aspect of methods, execution. The execution of a method's logic. When a program is running, it typically cycles through the code base executing line after line of code. Inevitably, it will reach an invoked method. When faced with an invoked method, the program reads through it, executing the defined logic. And then the program moves on. But here is a question. What if we did not want the logic to be executed immediately? What if we wanted to somehow tell the program that we have this method and the data for its parameters, but we don't want the logic to be executed yet? How can we delay logic from being executed for an unknown amount of time? Enter the topic of this video, the command pattern. As previously stated, when programs reach invoked methods, that method's logic is to be executed immediately. This is the fundamental idea behind the command pattern. Encapsulating a method and any data that it may require inside a storable object so that it can be executed at a later time. What exactly is a storable object, though? In object oriented programming and C, -sharp, the objects we are most familiar with are instances of classes. Classes, being the blueprints for an object, essentially define what the object is. In other words, what it needs to be made, details about it, and what logic it can do, its methods. Instances of classes are when we use that blueprint while the program is running to create the object. These instances can then be stored and use their defined methods at any time. And that is the key difference we get by using the command pattern. We replace invoked methods that execute logic instantaneously with commands. Commands are classes that wrap the method and logic we want performed. And as we just learned, we can create an instance of a class, allowing us to execute its methods and logic at a later time. So that is the idea behind the command pattern. But its implementation in C-sharp, Unity, and our games are where the benefits can really shine. Let's map this out. There are five components that we want to understand with this pattern. The abstract command, the concrete command, the command invoker, the command receiver, and the command client. Without the command pattern, the client triggers a method of a particular target, the receiver. Typically, the logic is actually defined by the receiver, so it is something that the receiver knows how to do. A class and a method of the class. But with the command pattern, we add in a middle layer. Instead of invoking a method, the client will create an instance of a concrete command. 
the invoker will store the instance, and then later the invoker will execute the command on or using the receiver. And the invoker has the guarantee that every command can be executed because all commands inherit the ability to be executed from the abstract class. So to summarize, the client creates a command intended for the receiver, but gives it to the invoker because the invoker can execute the command at a later time. This is a lot of abstract thinking, so here's a somewhat meta example to hopefully help conceptualize each component of the command pattern. If I tell you or command you to like this video, I, the client, created the command like this video that was intended for your hand, the receiver, which knows how to move the mouse, press the like button, and like the video. But I gave the command to your brain because it's the invoker in this situation. It knows how to store the command for either immediate or later use. Your hand might be busy holding a phone, drinking coffee, by giving the command to your brain, the command can either be executed immediately if your hand is free or at a later time. In this example, your brain, the invoker, will at some point tell your hand, the receiver, to move the mouse, press the like button, and execute my command. Cool. Let's dive into a simple project and some code for a more concrete example. In this project, we have a light bulb game object. The light bulb has a script appropriately titled light bulb and a method turn on. Turn on has the logic necessary to, you guessed it, turn on the light. We also have a user input script, which is a mono behavior class that is constantly listening for the user's input. It is currently hard coded that pressing spacebar will invoke the lights turn on method in the scene. Let's think back to the list of command pattern components. This example currently has the client, the user input, and the receiver, the light bulb. Let's refactor this hard-coded logic to use the command pattern instead. What are we currently missing? The abstract command, the concrete command, and the command invoker. How do we go about implementing each? All concrete commands should have an execute method. This guarantees that when the invoker is ready to use its sword commands, all the invoker needs to do is call execute on any of them. But in programming, how can we be sure that all command classes have the execute method? This is where the abstract command comes in. Two ideas are to create an abstract class or create an interface. With an abstract class, we define methods on a base class that others can derive from. We would write an abstract command class, define the execute method, and have our concrete command classes derive from this base class. However, this means that the execute method would always have the same logic, severely limiting its reusability. Alternatively, we can also make the execute method abstract as well. This means that any classes that derive from the base class can and must define the execute method's functionality. This is better, but in c -sharp, we have the option to use interfaces, and that's going to be the suggestion from this tutorial. A c -sharp interface defines a contract. This contract is between the interface itself and whatever class is using it, stating that the interface's methods must be defined. So if the command interface exposes an execute method, and all of the command classes implement the command interface, then the classes must define execute. This sounds awfully like the abstract command class with the abstract execute method that we were talking about before. However, a class can derive from multiple interfaces, which really increases the interchangeability and reusability of concrete commands. So, we'll create a new C -sharp script titled iCommand i being the prefix for interfaces. We'll define an interface, which includes an execute member. Worth noting that we can call this whatever makes sense within the context of our games, i action, i order, i command, etc.
Now that we've defined the abstract command, we'll move on to the concrete command. As we know, all concrete commands are going to derive from at least the I command interface. This guarantees that the execute method is going to be on all concrete commands. Plain and simple, if it doesn't derive from this interface, it's not a command. To name commands, we'll start with the name of the action or method that the command is performing and add command. In our example project here, the command is going to turn on the light. So we can call this turn on command and have it derive from I command. If we think of our meta example from before, we would consider a like video command. Now, what makes up a concrete command? Because of the interface, we can guarantee that the concrete command will define the execute method. It's here where we will write the logic from the original implementation. However, sometimes this logic will need to reference a particular class instance or take in parameters. So what we can do is store this data when we create the instance using what's known as a constructor. A constructor is a special method always called when we first create the instance of or instantiate a class. In the case of our turn on command, we'll pass the reference to the light bulb on instantiation and store it. And then in the execute method, we'll have the light bulb reference invoke its turn on method. Okay, let's put this new concrete command to use. Back in the user input file, we'll replace the current logic that is hard-coded. Instead, we'll instantiate a new turn on command that can be stored in a variable of type I command. And below that, we'll invoke the turn on command's execute method. In play mode, we can now see that our light bulb will still turn on, which is great. But we are still missing a crucial component of the command pattern, the command invoker. Currently, there isn't much of a difference between the original implementation and the current implementation. By completing the command pattern and adding in the command invoker, this pattern enables us to do quite a few things. With the invoker, we can create a list of all commands that have been and are to be executed. By adding each command to this list, we create a history. And what makes this special is that what can be added can also be taken away meaning we can relatively easily undo previous commands. The invoker also handles the actual execution of the commands, so we can have multiple clients or triggers using the same invoker. To bring back the meta example, if I were to tell you to like this video and your mom tells you to take out the trash, that's two clients creating separate commands for the same invoker. And the invoker can even decide how it wants to execute each command in the list. It can execute them all at once. It can execute the commands that are most recently added, execute the oldest, the most important. That's the cool thing about the invoker, is that we can tailor its functionality to the needs of our game systems. This leads to a noteworthy point about the command pattern. Its actual implementation can vary. More specifically, while the interface and concrete commands are typically structured how we've used them here, the logic within the command invoker is what can take on many forms. So while this light bulb is a rather simple example, in the future, we'll take a look at alternative implementations that conform to the games we're actually making. Today's video is more about understanding the concepts behind the pattern. For this first example of what an invoker can be, let's create a new class called light switch. This light switch class will be in charge of turning on our light. To do so, it will need to somehow access the turn on command that is currently in the client and call execute on the command. The most basic way we can do this is to store a single command within the invoker called on command. We would set this in the constructor of the invoker and in a local method called power on, execute the on command. In our user input file, we can create and store the invoker by instantiating a light switch. When we instantiate the light switch, it expects the turn on command. And now when we press spacebar, we'll use the light switch's power on method. 
testing this, we'll see that the light once again turns on. Awesome. At this point, we have successfully decoupled the client and the receiver as much as we possibly can using the command pattern. What this means is that the client knows as little as possible about the receiver, which ultimately makes them both more independent. Okay, we now realize that a light bulb and light switch should also be able to turn off. We can add the turn off functionality to the light in multiple ways. But the way we are going to do it today is by refactoring our light bulb class and commands. Instead of a turn on method in the light bulb class, we'll have a toggle power method which will either turn the light on or off depending on its current state. We'll then rename and modify the turn on command appropriately to toggle power command and change the execute definition to call the light bulb's toggle power. We'll also rename the power on method of the light switch to the toggle power as well. In the user input class, we'll rename the turn on command to toggle power command and change the light switch's power on method to toggle power too. Testing again in play mode, and now when we press spacebar, the light bulb will turn on and off. Cool. Now, this is one of the simplest examples of the invoker, but we can make the invoker do more. This implementation is missing what most invokers include, a stored list of commands. And without that list, we're not maximizing the command pattern's usefulness. To really showcase this, let's extend our example a bit. We've gone ahead and upgraded our light bulb. It is now one of those fancy Philips Hue lights that can change color. This functionality is defined within two new methods on the light bulb class that will change the bulb's color to either the one that is passed in or a random color. And we also have a new command, change color command. This command will also derive from I command and will set the random color method of the light bulb in execute. This increase in functionality requires something more advanced than the light switch. So let's remove the code related to this first invoker in our user input file, and then set up our more advanced invoker. Let's imagine that Philips Hue light bulbs are controlled with an app. We'll create a new invoker called light app, where the light switch stored a single command at instantiation. The light app will instead store a list of commands over time. For this tutorial, we will use a stack as the type of the list. But, as mentioned, there are multiple other list types that the invoker can use. Of course, this list starts out empty, so how do we actually add commands like the toggle power command? In the light app's constructor, we'll instantiate a new stack. Instead of a toggle power method like the light switch, we'll rename that to something more generic, add command. Add command will expect a command as a parameter. And inside of this method, it will invoke execute on the command argument, followed by adding the command to the list using the stack's push method. In the client or user input file, we can add the light app invoker. We can then use the light app's add command method when spacebar is pressed, passing in a new toggle power command. And we can do the same for the change color command on a separate input listener. We'll use the C key. Now, pressing spacebar will turn on the light bulb, add the command to the list, and execute it. Pressing C will change the color, add another command to the list, and execute that command. And one more time, pressing space will turn off the light, adding a third command and executing it. Wonderful! We can now turn the light on, off, and change its color. But we might notice that this list doesn't really do much for us yet. The last thing we'll cover in this tutorial is one of the many benefits that the command pattern offers, which is to undo previous commands. As we know, the command interface currently guarantees that all the commands will define an execute method. We can use the same guarantee to ensure that all commands have an undo method as well. So updating the I command interface will add in undo. Our two commands must now also define the undo method. But how does undo work? When we use each command, we are essentially telling the light to do a specific thing. 
So if we want to undo, we would have it do the opposite. For the toggle power command, this would be rather hard to tell the difference between triggering undo and just pressing space again, because both will result in the light turning off or on depending on its current state. But changing the light is a different story. When creating an instance of the change color command, we will store the current color in a separate variable using the constructor. This means that when the command is initially added to the list and is executed, changing the color of the light bulb, that command will remember and be storing the previous color. So to define the undo functionality of the change color command, all we need to do is set the light bulb instance's color back to the stored previous color. And for the toggle power command, the undo will just reverse the current state using the light bulb's toggle power. However, we don't have a place in our code that calls a command's undo method. As we know, the invoker is the middleman that actually calls the methods of the commands. While add command calls execute on each of the commands and adds it to the list, let's create an undo method that calls undo on the last element and removes it from the list. We can easily remove the last command using the stacks pop method. All we need to do is add another input handler for the client, we'll use the Z key, and invoke the light app's undo command method. If we enter play mode, we can turn the light on, change the colors, and press Z to undo our previous commands. Fantastic! Now the command pattern is pretty wild because it can be defined in so many ways. And in future videos, we'll definitely expand more on this pattern with advanced implementations to showcase what it can really help accomplish. Awesome. Thank you to all the current patrons for selecting this video's topic. It was a blast getting to learn another behavioral pattern and share that with the community. If you would like to vote on the next tutorial that we'll cover on this channel and access the project files from my videos, consider supporting the channel over on Patreon. And a special shout out to Zach Etier and OneBeats for their extra support. If you're interested in joining an awesome growing community of developers just like yourself, we'd love to have you in the iHeartGameDev channel Discord. That's all for today. Thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.